So um, my uh, talk today, I want to reflect um, on walking in the context of archaeological survey and specifically a project that I'm involved in, in um, called the Loughborough Landscape Project, which is a survey project based in Dumfries and Galloway in the south of Scotland. At Loughborough, we've been using a variety of non-destructive survey techniques to investigate the landscape and setting of a prehistoric complex of sites, all of which were first identified as crop marks in aerial photographs. The working plays a big part in all of the methods that we've used at Loch Brow. So from the beginning of uh, the Loch Brow project, I started to think about the practice of walking, uh, the experience of the repeated and systematic walking we're undertaking in one location as part of everyday field survey, the feel of the ground beneath my feet, and the subtleties of the topography as I walked, and how this might influence and transform our understanding of this landscape and archaeology. Walking, uh, by necessity, is part of all archaeological practice in the field, but particularly field survey. In the case of Loch Brow, I was also trying to develop and incorporate a broadly experiential methodology to draw different aspects of our site and landscape. So could that walking, and the way in which we encounter a place through walking, have effect on our interpretations? So that really was my starting point. So today what I want to do is start by giving a little bit of background to my thinking, then I'll introduce the Loughborough Landscape Project and the way in which walking has been a part of our practice. I'll finish by reflecting on the effect of that walking and what I think that means for the way in which we as a project team, and me specifically, have come to understand and interpret a place and a landscape. So, my thinking has developed really as I've reflected on the Loughborough Project and as I've walked um, a lot as part of the project. So, for li as a little bit of background, my starting point is that walking across sites and landscapes is not a neutral practice. It's usually something we employ unthinkingly, particularly as part of archaeological <coughs> survey. But the way in which we walk and approach the sites, the sites we walk across and through has the potential to affect the way in which we come to understand an archaeological site or landscape and so the narratives we build. So why do I consider this the case? Well, um, there are a number of interconnected fa factors. Firstly, uh, we perceive through the whole body, and it's arguably through the feet that are most in contact with <coughs> our surroundings. We don't, uh, for the most part, perceive things from a single vantage point. We move around something, we walk, we look at it from different angles to take it in and understand it better. And when I was thinking about that, that can be illustrated quite well in the way in which I approach an archaeological site as part of my day job, which involves um, assessing archaeological sites for scheduling. So to gain a when I, if I first approach a site to gain a perspective of it, one of the first things I'll do when first approaching a site is to circle it several times, trying to see it from, from all angles, trying to gain a sense of what it is, trying to perceive and understand it. And so I'm basically, that's basically me on the left hand side of that, that slide every time I go to a new site and don't understand what's going on. Um, so. What I'm saying is that perception comes through walking <coughs> and movement. If walking does come through walk, walking, if perception does come through walking and movement, then what we come to perceive must in part depend on how we move. As we move, we're in contact with the ground beneath our feet, and as we walk, every nuance of the ground is incorporated into muscular consciousness, mediated through our choice of footwear. Directions of approach are dictated by roads, tracks, paths or gates into fields. Uh, some of these approaches might be centuries old, others uh, of much more recent date. But they affect the direction from which we come to approach sites, the way in which we move through a landscape, and the way in which we come to perceive and understand that place or that landscape. Related to this is the fact that we, as we move through a place or landscape, sites and features reveal themselves to us in order. So the way we experience and the order in which we encounter features affects how we come to <coughs> know a place or a landscape. So if anyone has had the experience of walking out the path and then on that return walk journey walking back on the same path, but that path seeming really on the features that, um, on either side or the path itself seeming quite unfamiliar, then you know what that directionality means. So the order in which we encounter things is relevant to our perception and understanding. Together, this produce, produces particular ways of knowing, which in turn influences the way we come to know and understand the archaeology and landscapes we seek to study. Walking is also a way of getting to know a place <coughs> or a landscape, and something we often employ to get more familiar with somewhere. 
often when I go to a new place or move to a new city, one of the first things I'll do is just walk around it to try and become more familiar with it, to get to know it. But as we get to know something, we enter into a relationship with it, and it's from that relationship that we develop interpretations, create narratives and stories. So in a way, walking is also a way in which we potentially build ourselves into the stories that we tell about a place. And it's that relationship that I'd like to talk about in relation to, to Loughborough and the Loughborough Landscape Project. So let me just give you a little bit of background to the Loughborough Landscape Project and the ways of walking. Uh, the Loughborough Landscape Project is an archaeological survey project based in Loughborough and Dumfries and Gallo Galloway, which is in the south of Scotland. It's an independent research project that I've been undertaking with Helen Goodchild of York University and Dorothy Graves McCune of Edinburgh University. Now at Loch Rau, um, a number of archaeological sites were recorded as crop marks and aerial photographs during the 1980s and 1990s in the fields around Loch Rau Farm. The crop marks indicate a complex of prehistoric sites ranging in date from the early Neolithic to the Iron Age. Uh, now the, the sites uh, sit within these two fields at Loch, to the west of Loch Rau Farm. Uh, from 2010 to 2015, the Loch Rau Landscape Project undertook geophysical survey, experiential survey and soil coring over these two fields as well as the reassessment of the aerial photographs all over a series of very short field seasons. Um, in terms of the archaeology itself, uh, in the field to the north uh, we know we have a timber cursus, <coughs> two timber circles, so there's the timber circles that are there, okay. the two um, timber circles, a number of uh, round barrels along with a series of uh, less definite features that we can't yet put a possible date on, which have been picked up by geophysics. And this is a, a composite image of the information we've interpreted from both um, aerial photographs and geophysics. And this is the field we focus most of our efforts on, so I'll be largely talking about the, uh, later on about the curses and um, the archaeology in that field. So i just pop that slide in, just in case anyone's unfamiliar with the kind of sites that I'm talking about. Um, so that's the north field. In the field to the south, uh, there are two overlapping settlement enclosures in blue there, and one <coughs> solitary round barrow that round, uh, uh, site to the west on, uh, of that, that diagram there. And this is an interpretation just from the crop marks that haven't incorporated geophysical results into this one. As the, the archaeology at Loughborough, as I said, has been uh, recorded, identified exclusively as crop marks and aerial photographs, the archaeology is exclusively a buried archaeology uh, that has been revealed as crop marks. And there are no above ground features. And this is a photograph of the North Fields, which is the field in which the cursus and timber circles uh, have been recorded. Uh, so because there are no above ground features, to, to all intents and purposes, it looks like an empty field. So this is the kind of archaeology in the landscape that we're concerned with at Loch Brown. Now, as I said, we've been, we've been employing a variety of different survey methods at Loch Brown. With geophysics, uh, we've surveyed the whole of that north field as radiometry, which is an area of around 13 hectares. And I think we worked out we've walked something like 85 kilometres in the north field, just in the survey group themselves. <coughs> We've also surveyed a large proportion of the south field um, as well as targeted areas with resistance survey. And these are the results in the surveys, and I'm not going to talk about them at all, but just to give you an idea of the amount of ground we've covered. As well as the, the geophysics, I've been developing a broadly experiential or phenomenologically inspired methodology, which has involved first marking out the known archaeology in the ground with flags. As I said, there's no above ground features, um, so actually being able to place the archaeology or known sites on the ground is uh, flagging, marking them out in the ground with flags has been really quite important for, for understanding where they sit in the landscape. So the, the first step has been to mark out the known archaeology in the ground and then record sight and sound across the survey area. Both of these survey methods, as well as simply walking around two very large fields, require a considerable amount of walking. As well as that, I've developed, also developed a kind of walking tour around the flagged out archaeology that I take in new volunteers or visitors to the site around. And I've also tried to do some wider walking beyond the confines of these two fields. So at Loch Rau, walking has been incorporated into our practice in a number of different ways. Some explicitly, and others just a consequence of the survey methods. But all form 
uh, part of our experience of place and landscape and thereby inform how we come to know and understand this place, whether that's explicitly acknowledged or not. And I want to now just look very briefly at each in turn, so I'll go through the different types of walking um, on this slide. So if we start with geophysics, um, as I'm sure uh, you're aware, this is undertaken in a systematic manner, on a grid pattern, and involves walking backwards and forwards with the instrument across a series of traverses within each grid, progressing slowly from grid to grid across the field. This is an, in an intense, systematic walking, and in the case of the North Field, it's covered the whole of, whole of that field. It's the most intense walking that we've undertaken at Loch Brow. Now, this repeated walking is usually seen as a, as a very mundane aspect, something we just have to do to gather the data that we need. But with that repeated walking, whether as the instrument operator as one of those moving tapes, comes increased familiarity with that place. We're forced to spend a lot of time in that place and to walk both systematically and intensively across our chosen survey area. But that familiarity is not just head knowledge or broad experience, that, this is also an, an increased physical knowledge. At Loch Brow, there are some very distinct topographical differences. And as we walked, as we were doing that, that, that geophysical survey, we were all, all physically engaging with the lie of the land. We were, we were all too aware of those parts of the field with steep inclines, for example, and those which were flat and level. We all fe felt the steep inclines in our knees, knew that relief of reaching a level area of the field, and felt the errors of walking in our muscles. That physical knowledge is amplified by the intense, systematic nature of the geophysics. But as well as those distinct topographical highs and lows, this is a landscape with subtle lumps and bumps of the sort that I was aware of through my Wellington feet. And this affected the way in which I experienced the landscape as a help with the survey. This is a landscape that's been flattened by the plough, so topographical differences as well as ar um, archaeological features will, will have been levelled out and rounded off. And as I repeatedly walked, I certainly became aw very aware of the subtleties and texture of the land beneath my feet and the slight differences in topography. With my knowledge of the buried archaeology, I began thinking of how those subtle topographical differences related to the known archaeology. And I was able to um, incorporate that some of that, <coughs> I tried to incorporate some of that into my interpretations of the archaeology itself. The ground itself, then, and the way in which we walk across it, is not inert, but plays a part in the experience of this place today, and thereby the way in which we, potentially, we come to know and potentially understand that place. So this has been in part a physical knowing. As well as geophysics, uh, we've also done what I've termed experiential survey, as I mentioned earlier, in essence, there are two elements to this. The first step has been to mark out the known archaeology in the ground with flags, using coordinates taken from mapped crop marks and a differential GPS. As I said earlier, um, there are no elements surviving above the ground, so this was <coughs> important simply uh, as a means of firmly locating the known, known sites on the ground, but also to allow us to walk a movement within the ground plans of our sites. Laying out the flags themselves, that process of laying out the flags with the GPS meant walking the entire boundary of the known archaeological sites and placing flags at intervals. That very ever act of walking the boundary of the monument has been interesting, exploratory and revealing, crystallising and making more solid the location of the boundaries of the monuments, and forcing whoever is placing the flag uh, to walk the entire boundary of our sites, something we wouldn't have done otherwise. Once marked out in the ground, we spent time walking through and around the flagged out archaeology, placing ourselves in relation to small red flags and allowing them at least to <coughs> partly structure how we walk across this field. It's interesting that such a slight intervention can influence where we walk across a field. As we walked within the flags, my perspectives on the monuments of the Loch Brow certainly changed and crystallised as I noted elements of the monuments morphology in place in their landscape and orientated myself in a different way as I walked through these fields. And it was interesting, as I said, that such a small intervention, such small features as little flags in the ground, could have quite a big effect of how we positioned ourselves in relation to the, to the, the, um, the, the landscape, the rest of that landscape. And that kind of crystallisation and those no, new ideas and, and um, observations are sort of things that have really only come about through um, repeated walking, repeated observation in and round and through those flag, flagged out archaeology. And the second step has been to record sight and sound across and within our sites from and to a number of set recording points. Um, uh, that, 
that was really a, a, as a, a, a means of trying to understand how sight and sound varies across our site today to help us to, be, to begin to get think about how sight and sound may have varied across our site in the past. Um, so said, the second step can record sight and sound across and within our sites from from and to a number of set recording points. While well, the recording of sight and sound is undertaken at set static, set static points, the process of getting to those points is involved in tense and repeated walking from <coughs> recording point to recording point, usually in relation to the flagged out archaeology and largely within the confines of, of the modern fields. Ultimately, or at least that for now at least, uh, the stage we've got to, we're trying to understand that, that, that information that we've gathered. That intense walking has been depicted as, as um, lines of sight of hearing plans, which you can see in, on the uh, top right. Which in a way actually serves to kind of almost depict some of our, our roots of walking and how intense that has been, but how it's been focused between set points <coughs> um, on and around our, our known sites. So this has involved quite extensive walking across more or less the whole extent of the field. But because we use set recording points, we walked intensely and repeatedly over the same points of the field and across the same parts of the flagged out archaeology. So this is an intense uh, but repeated walking. Informed by that experiential walking, I've de also developed a kind of walking tour around the archaeology that I usually take any new volunteer or visitor to the site to the site um, around. Um, so I take them around the flag at archaeology to help them orientate themselves and to understand the archaeology of Loch Brow and the dimensions and nature of the known sites. What I've discovered ha has happened, as I've done that on repeated occasions, is that I've unconsciously developed a prescribed and choreographed routes around the flag at archaeology. And this has been completely unconscious. Um, I tried to develop a very broadly chronological route to try and explain the archaeology and the chronology of, of, of the archaeology at Loch Brow. Um, but it's also developed, it's developed out, out of my own understanding of the archaeology at Loch Brow and a desire to walk within it and to communicate that archaeology to anybody who comes to the site. And we've had many volunteers who have very li have limited um, experience of archaeology, so um, particularly when you've got a site where there's no above ground archaeology, it's quite important to be able to explain what it is we're doing and why on earth we're surveying a field that has apparently got nothing in it. But the, that kind of walking, that choreographed walking, has developed both out of my own understanding of the archaeology at Loch Rye, but it's also been influenced and structured by the present layout of the landscape. So principally, the, um, <coughs> I always begin at the south end of the field, I walk along the curses from south to north. And the reason I do that is because the gate into the field is at the south. So access into the field and the order in which I encounter the features of this field, and I have done on ev during all my field seasons, and how I walk through the flagged out archaeology brings it, begins at the south and progresses north. In fact, this has affected the way in which I discuss the curses. I always tend now to talk about walking up the curses and the north end as the top. To me, the curses has, has developed or has become to have an orientation, and that's developed very un unconsciously as I repeatedly walked around the field. This is not conscious, it's just something I, did, I discovered that I was doing as I was talking about the curses. So in its own way then, um, my walks around the flagged out archaeology, whether it's part of a tour or not, have been structured not just by the flags on the ground, but also by the present layout of the landscape and the way in which um, those flagged out features present themselves or encounters as I walk. This undoubtedly is an effect in the way in which I understand the curses, in particular at Loch Brow. And it's definitely a factor in the way in which I communicate it to anyone who comes to sight. So is the directionality of my walking reinforcing particular interpretations about, about the site? Is it influencing, however unconsciously, the way in which I come to understand and interpret the archaeology and landscape at Loch Brow? I would say that it probably is. What would have happened if access to the field had been on the east or the west? How might that have altered my perception of the monument? And what would happen to my perception and interpretations if I chose to walk across the curses rather than going up and down it? Of course, it's not just the directionality of the tours around Loch Brow uh, that is structured by the present layout of the landscape. I talked at the start of this presentation about the archaeology at Loch Brow being within two fields. Well, of course, those fields are relatively modern, but in essence, they constrain where we've walked, they contain our walking, and potentially contain our interpretations and narratives. So as a way of trying to counter this and of expanding out our understanding of Loch Brow, 
and its place within its wider landscape. I've also tried to walk around the landscape of Loch Bray more widely. What I find is, as, is that as I wind my walking, my perspective on Loch Bray and its place within its wider landscape and context is widened too, and I've come to know and experience a wider area, area around the core of our site. I've been able to draw more into the narratives I create. In some ways, this has made Loch Brow seem smaller. <coughs> it's one small site within a large landscape, and only one site this period among many. But it's also opened up different perspectives on the landscape and the monument's location. But, as you can see, from these are GPS traces in, um, in red, and this is just a little bit of walking I did um, in September this year. Um, my walking was still constrained and structured by the layout of roads and paths through the landscape. Now, I have done a bit more than this, but I didn't think to take a GPS with me up until this year. Um, but what this illustrates is that my encounters were, and always will be, mediated through and starting in the modern landscape. It's the only place within, any of us, within which any of us can walk. So, if, as the quote in the abstract for this session suggests, the movement of walking is a way of knowing, then how have the different forms of walking influenced our knowing and understanding of Loch Brow? Well, I think that each has a part to play, and each has provided a slightly different perspective or way of knowing. Geophysical uh, walking has aided the creation of a physical knowing, experiential survey a structured knowing, and wider landscape walking an expanded knowing. And of course, each way of knowing, knowing is not exclusive to the individual types of walking that I've described. What is relevant is that each adds each way of walking um, adds to our experience of moving across and through a place and landscape. Each has the potential to alter or modify our perception of that place and contributes to the, to the way we come to know and understand a place and landscape. That knowledge is cumulative and repeated <coughs> walking can have the effect of gradually, gradually revealing more. It can transform interpretations on one hand but may also reinforce particular narratives and understandings. Walking also helps us to get to know something better, and as we do that, we enter into a relationship with it. And as I've walked in and around Loch Brow, these places have become part of my consciousness and mental map, part of my physical map too, as I felt the topography of my muscles and the ground beneath my feet. Whether consciously or not, the areas I've walked have been part of the, become part of the story I weave about this place, and they've served to widen Loch Brow's place in my mind and have influenced the narratives I create. But that relationship, that knowledge and narrative creation is also influenced by the way in which we encounter places. As I walk, I find it's opened up new, new narratives and ideas. But by its very nature, that also closes down others. So the act of walking is not a neutral act, and I think has a potential to greatly influence our knowledge of place, landscape and archaeological sites, and also impact the formation of archaeological narratives and knowledge. In essence, places and landscapes like Loch Brow can only be more fully understood through the feet, but those feet, the directions they take and the knowings they formulate are not always unbiased. So thank you very much for listening, and there's just a few people I need to acknowledge. So.